Good morning. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the Bay Area Science Festival event with Swiss Next San Francisco, presented by Swiss Next San Francisco. Um, for those of you who don't know, we're an organization that brings together research, arts, and science from Switzerland, connecting Switzerland and California in the US. Um, just to say we're we're presenting digital events uh, now in this time of COVID, but we also have a physical space at Pier 17. Some of you may know us as the, the organization that sits across from the Exploratorium. Um, we're hoping to invite you back to our physical space soon, but in the meantime, do check out all of our events. We have great digital programming, uh, lots of programs coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, over the years, SwissNext has uh, worked, participated in multiple events with the Bay Area Science Festival, um, bringing projects from Switzerland in 2011, which I believe was the first year of the festival. We developed an Art of Robots program where we brought the Museum of Science Fiction in Switzerland, UC Berkeley's Center for New Media, and ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And we, did, we examined robotics from the viewpoint of robotic research and art. And in 2015, we brought EPFL's um, bio-inspired robots. That's a university in Lausanne, a technical university. And we brought their bio-robots research to the festival's Nerd Night at the Alcatraz. So we're excited to, to join you again um, in, in light of the festival here. As you all have experienced, of course, um, this year we're digital and we're in this crazy world of uh, COVID-19, um, unsure of what's gonna happen next. So our program this year is focused on community responses to COVID, uh, how they've started and been initiated in Switzerland and in the Bay Area. Um, as the world struggles to reopen, as many of you know, the numbers are rising and falling. The Bay Area is starting to open again, reducing restrictions. And on the other hand, Switzerland is impl implementing more, more restrictions as Europe experiences a second wave. While we wait for this vaccine, what can we do as a community? We have different strengths and skills. We come from different backgrounds. Live, we live in different kinds of conditions and we have different impacts by this epidemic. So today we're bringing together Hack Zurich and Stanford Bay Initiative, who are gonna show us two responses that were enacted quickly, um, that were enacted quickly when COVID happened to respond quickly. Um, they're pre, they existed before COVID uh, in, uh, as a hackathon and as a university curriculum course. And um, they both have these connections to universities. But that then they turn to this COVID solution, trying to find a way to work with communities. Um, so the question we're, we're thinking about today, we're gonna learn about these initiatives and think about how, how can we as communities collaborate with universities, governments, nonprofits, and corporates, different kinds of stakehold, stakeholders to enact changes for our local conditions. That's what we're here to discuss, and uh, we're excited to have both U.S. and Swiss perspectives on this. Before we start, some of you are probably new to Remo, this platform. Um, Remo is a networking platform. It's kind of fun to use. It's different than the Zoom webinar we've become so accustomed to. You'll have, right now, we're in a presentation mode. Um, there's always the chat function where you're welcome to enter your questions. Um, and there's a Q and a, rather there's a Q and A for questions and a chat function. Um, at one point, so we'll have our presentations for about a half hour, and then we'll do our breakout tables, which you already experienced when you first came into Remo. You can hop from table to table by double clicking a chair in another space. Um, and what we'll do when we break out is we'll have a, a note taker at each table and a, a set of questions. Uh, you can all sort of think about collectively how you would, what would your approach be? What are, what are the issues that you face in your community with COVID? So um, I want to introduce you first to our, uh, we have two speakers today, Jansu Kulha, 
of the Stanford Bay Initiative, and Setara Jobari of Hack Zurich. They'll both present their programs. While they're presenting, another unique thing to Remo is you'll need to double click their, their shared screen, which will pop up. Um, and when you double click that, you see it as a full screen presentation, and that's a better experience. Um, yeah, so we'll do these, we'll have our presentations, we'll do our breakout, and then we'll, we'll return with uh, Q and A's and discussions. At the end of the, um, at the end of the program, as you'll, you'll receive, a few days after the program rather, you'll receive an email from Swiss Next thanking you for your participation, and we will share in a document all the different discussions and findings that we had from today's session. It'll be interesting, I think, to learn what similarities and differences we all had based on our local, um, our local conditions. So now we'll start with our, our speakers. Our first speaker will be Set. She joined Hack Zurich and the Digital Festival at its founding in 2016. Today, the Digital Festival is a successful and well-known hub for CEOs, decision makers, and tech talents in Switzerland. In 2020, Set joined the Code versus COVID-19 team to launch a 72-hour nonprofit online hackathon. There were 3,000 participants from around the world, and they developed prototypes to fight the COVID-17 crisis. Before this, she was developing programs to support gender equality and career development for young academics, young academics at the career services of the University of Zurich for several years and supported women's counseling for women affected by sexual or domestic violence. She has a master's of social science from the University of Zurich and a background in cultural studies and cultural analysis. So thank you so much, Set, for being here today. Look forward to seeing your presentation. All right, thank you very much, Mary Ellen. Thank you for the nice intro. Um, I will quickly share my screen with you, everyone, and then you won't see me anymore, but at least you can see the slides. So let me do that quickly. Um, I should be here. Well, it's not. Let me just go back and reopen. PowerPoint crashed. Well, now we're there. So. All right. So thank you all very much for joining the session today. I was very much looking forward to sharing experiences and learnings with you here. It's a safe space and um, I like to continue further fight COVID-19 with you all, hopefully. And it's important that we do that because um, we are all in this together, right? And however, we all make individual experiences and we all have needs that need to be addressed, right? So I will share my learnings and experiences with you here related to our hackathon, Code versus COVID-19, which took place in March 27 to address, to address uh, pressing issues related to COVID. And just in case anybody doesn't know what a hackathon is, I quickly lay out the basic features. So a hackathon is basically creative mass collaboration on a deadline. People voluntarily form teams to address problems and then design a solution quickly. And two things are important here to understand. Those solutions don't have to be perfect at all. It's not the aim of a hackathon. It's rather the opposite. At a hackathon, you're aiming for an MVP. It's a minimal viable product that shows the basic features of your solution. But, and that is also important, that solution should ideally be a functioning prototype. So basically a hackathon starts with a problem or a need that is challenged by a team. And this often happens with a creative combination of available resources leading to the actual hack. So teams mostly pick problems that personally affect them or problems with a real market need. And hence many startups emerge from hackathons and more importantly, Hackathons are a challenging and rewarding experience, especially if you work on a solution for a problem that personally affects you or can be helpful for the rest of the world. And that's why we address the rest of the world. As you can see on this slide, we reached out quite a lot. Our goal for Code versus COVID was to develop open source prototypes online within 72 hours. Um, 
And those topics included like a novel public information rescue systems, methods of infection detection, tools for medical support like logistics and operations, or distancing and e-learning tools to facilitate interaction, remote working and learning. So we reached out to everyone, to the government, namely the Federal Department of Home Affairs, Economic Affairs and the Public Health. We co collaborated with uh, some universities, which are among the top 10 universities, like the ETH Zurich or EPFL Zurich, uh, EPFL, sorry, Lausanne. We reached out to the media. As you can see, there was quite some coverage on the initiative. We reached out to individuals and communities with expertise in data science and technology, also healthcare institutions, epidemiology, medical health institutions to get data. And we did not just ask them to participate, we asked them to contribute data, technology or support with communications globally or as a mentor. So it was a real community. And we had like nine days to prepare this nonprofit open source hackathon. And that was quite a challenge. But as you can see here in yellow, we had like 3000 participants from over 80 countries. And we worked throughout 22 time zones and developed 306 prototypes. And if you sum this up all together, we worked 100,000 hours on solutions addressing COVID-19. And this equals roughly 385 working years of a single person's life. So you have to imagine what we put into this to get this together. And you can see all projects on uh, DevPost. There's a project gallery. So I quickly highlight my most interesting project that came out on this um, hackathon. The greatest hackathon outcome was actually this app that you see here on the screen. It's the official Swiss contact tracing app, which is now in use all over the country, endorsed by the government and available on the App Store and Google Play. Um, unfortunately, today the app has only about 1.7 million users in Switzerland. This equals 20% of the population. However, there should be much more people using this app because what you can see here, the number of COVID codes entered by users within seven days by October 18 was 2,544. Uh, 2, so what this app is teaching us is the following. The more people participate, the more valuable the solution will be. This is a principle that applies to many solutions and applications. The more people participate, the higher the value for every user will be. And this is in general called a network effect. So this experience showed us first that you have to collaborate and secondly, that you can achieve great outcomes in a short time, but you have to be very focused. And that's why the deadline is good. So um, the app really kicked off a global response like if you see this three, uh, if you see this project here, DP3T project, um, these were researchers from all around the world who collaborated to push this technology to become the new standard. You see EPFL until Stanford, there is Dan Bonet is their contact at Stanford, get involved. So what you have to know that is that technology used here, Bluetooth was never made for measuring proximity. However, it was somehow applicable during the hackathon. And now we have a solution that allows to trace anonymously and store data in a decentralized way to protect privacy. And that was really important. So the hack is actually to use Bluetooth to measure, measure proximity, even if it's not made for that. And is this approach also got uh, the tech giants inspired apple and google there was quite some work with those tech giants by the by the team and actually google and apple they set up new apis and specifications making it easier to build bluetooth apps and this was crucial to further develop uh, this technology as you can see on the slides google says they were very heavily inspired by the dp3t group and their approach and that's what we have adopted as a solution. So great response to that too. So um, 
the app also inspired other countries to adopt the solution or to switch from a centralized tracing app solution to a decentralized Swiss solution. For example, the UK and Germany, they first had this centralized solution. Now they switched and joined us for the decentralized solution. So we are aiming for country interoperability, making use of the network effect, hopefully in the future. So closing here already after seven and a half minutes, I'd like to leave you for now, knowing that whatever solution you come up with can trigger a global response and inspire people to keep moving as well. But the only way to contribute is to participate actually. And that's it for now. I will just end this presentation and I will now um, do that. So you can see me again, and I think we're going to take questions later. Yes, thank you so much, Beth. All right. We will take questions later. I have a lot of questions myself. I have to say, like, how how this can, the, the transition from this becoming incorporated or accepted by the government is a particularly fascinating one, um, uh, living in the U.S., you know, how that, how that goes. Like, how, how do you go from a hackathon I imagine working with startups and corporates is integral to that, but um, and university research. So, thank you. We'll get dig into those questions later. Okay. Thanks. So next, um, I'll introduce Jansu uh, from the Bay, the Stanford Bay Initiative. Jansu is a PhD candidate in the geophysics department at Stanford. She uses computational modeling techniques to model fluid and thermodynamic processes governing natural disasters for her PhD. At the start of the global lockdown, she helped redesign the Stanford Bay Initiative, Future Bay Initiative, to virtually and rapidly address the main issues posed by local government agencies in tackling COVID-19. Outside of her passion for research and teaching, she investigates alternate and creative ways to communicate science through her organization called ArtSci. Um, thank you so much, Jansu, for joining us today. Um, and I love that this this Art Sci organization sounds very appropriate today for the Bay Area Science Festival as well. So thank you so much. All right. Um, I think you all can hear me. Um, unfortunately, I can't see you all, which I really liked. But so I'm just going to jump into the presentation. And then afterwards, I'll get to know each of you. Um, thank you so much, Mary Ellen, for introducing me. Um, yes, I'm John Su, and normally for my research, I study fluid dynamics and thermodynamics, and you all probably know that uh, that seems a little different from COVID-19. However, with my research, what I realized is that um, this is a lot more timely and that this is something that I need to focus on um, when March came around and we went into a lockdown. Um, so there are some individuals here from Switzerland and um, some from the San Francisco Bay Area. So this figure here might not be uh, common to all of us. This is San Jose, which houses uh, multiple tech companies and uh, universities and such a diverse group of thinkers, workers, um, and doing all types of work and living very different lives. In San Jose, um, as with the rest of the world, was impacted. And since we at Stanford University are situated in the Greater Bay Area, more specifically in Silicon Valley, um, this is our community and these are the individuals that we closely work with. And the area prior to COVID-19 was dealing with issues regarding to transportation crisis. I think some of you know how bad the uh, traffic is in the area. Housing crisis, the prices are so high, um, not able to accommodate some of the individuals who are working uh, lower paying jobs. And also there are looming uh, uh, disasters ahead, such as sea level rise and major storms, wildfires. And most of these are happening right now. And so the Stanford Future Bay Initiative was originally 
created within Stanford to get students involved with their local community to start thinking and tackling these problems. Oftentimes, it's easy to just dive into one specific problem, such as a transportation crisis, um, and not think about the housing crisis or sea level rise. So the idea here is that we tap into a lot of different expertise since we have so many talented students to think about problems in a holistic sense. And that's how we're also approaching COVID-19. All right, so our stakeholders are the drivers of, of this initiative. Those are local community members around the, uh, around the Bay Area, namely San Mateo and Santa Clara. Um, so, so for those of you who don't know uh, San Francisco Bay Area that well, here's a map on the left. San Jose falls in the Santa Clara County area, and that's what the picture was from before. And Stanford is uh, situated within here as well. So this is our community. And on the uh, top right, I'm highlighting North Fair Oaks, which is a community made up of uh, low income um, and highly Latinx community. And those are individuals who oftentimes fall between the cracks when there is a major problem happening. And El Concilio of San Mateo County is another organization geared towards thinking critically about these individuals who oftentimes uh, do not get recognized in the, lar in the large uh, solutions for problems such as COVID-19. So these are our stakeholders. They uh, were also shocked, obviously, by COVID-19. And so what we did in spring 2020 is re-gear the class into, into tackling COVID-19 problems. And here's our flyer from when this uh, class originally got announced. Um, and yeah, and some of the students, you are also in this uh, event and uh, participants, and you'll be able to get to talk to them a little bit more. since. Uh, since this was a class, uh, we had objectives for learning experiences, and I led the modeling team for, for, this, for this class. So some of the questions that we were interested in teaching include what are uh, valuable topics to model within COVID-19? What are good questions to ask? Because when you're a modeler, you can model almost anything, but it's important to have a model that is answering a specific question with a goal in mind. You're trying to test a hypothesis. And then how do you develop or find um, a simulator, a, um, a, uh, an experiment, and how do you work with them uh, to tackle that specific question. And again, since this required a big collaboration with multiple different expertise, how do you collaborate on a project like this? All right, so on the right, you will see the students just from the spring 2020 um, class. Since then, we've also had uh, initiative continue through the summer and also now in the fall. And uh, the number of individuals who are working on this, I don't even know what the number is. It's so large. Um, and it also includes a lot of different uh, professors from multiple different um, departments, including law, including business and uh, geophysics. So it's, it's a large set of expertise. The initiative, initiative originally was um, a trifecta of education, reach, research, and practice, which means that uh, there, was, uh, there were students, academics, faculty members, and also policymakers who were working closely with one another. With COVID-19, what we were able to do was also bring in corporations to help out with our efforts, providing us data that otherwise we would not be able to have. And so such, we partnered up with the contact tracing team um, in the different counties, uh, California Connect, which allows uh, us to share data regarding public health. Um, also, you'll meet some of our international collaborators. Uh, Lars is on, the, uh, on this call as well, so you'll get to meet him. Um, and SafeGraph was one of the uh, uh, the corporations that started with us and sharing data 
on population behavior and human behavior. All right, and so I'm gonna specifically talk about the modeling project, uh, which did a shout out to Lars before. Um, and him and his team originally developed the simulator uh, at ETH Zurich, looking at uh, how the virus spreads given information about uh, the spatiotemporal uh, region that you're modeling. So for our case, because of the availability of data, we decided to look at San Francisco. And then from there, uh, the model allows us to look at the effectiveness of contact tracing. What, uh, what percentage of the population, if they have contact tracing and how effective would it be? As Seth mentioned, there are a lot of app-based contact uh, tracing solutions out there um, that are trying to tackle this problem. However, the percentage of people opting in is quite low. And so we're trying to think about uh, what this exactly means for the spread of the virus for San Francisco. And as mentioned before, we're interested in those individuals who are falling between the cracks. And these are at-risk workers. So we started off with uh, the initiative, initially looking at uh, these individuals, whether they be teachers, grocery store workers, um, because they are the individuals who are being contacted the most and connecting different communities uh, within the Bay Area. And so we were interested in looking at how they experience uh, the virus and how it's different. So here's a beautiful plot that was um, put together looking at, again, the app-based contact tracing at, at the individual level. And this is one of our strengths for um, the geophysics team that we're interested in looking at problems at all different scales. So those plots that you're seeing from before, let me just show you again, on the bottom right, are looking at is looking at dates and the number of infected people over time. And that's what all those bell curves are. And it's at a, a system scale, it's at the entire San Francisco scale. However, what we can do is then look at the individual scale and how individuals are experiencing um, COVID-19 and if they're equipped with a contact tracing app. So on the bottom, you're, what you'll see uh, in these panels are the number of messages individuals will, would be getting during this simulation event. And then on the Y axis, what you'll see is what state they were in um, when they received this, uh, this message. And so by looking at this in red dots, what we're able to do is identify when individuals stayed at home because of contact tracing versus uh, when individuals stayed at home because they started feeling symptoms and they got uh, tested for, for the virus. And so what we notice is that contact tracing, if 100% of the population has it, can actually result in a lot of individuals staying at home. But this also means that an individual might get a message uh, telling them to stay at home even though they did not contract the virus. And so this is one of the cool things that we're able to look at. Now what we're uh, also trying to study is how do third party contact tracing uh, methods compare to our good old word of mouth. Um, and so we're looking at automated contact tracing and manual contact tracing. Let me explain what the difference between those two are. The automated uh, contact tracing uh, relies on your cell phone application to uh, tell uh, one another that you got tested positive. Manual contact tracing relies on a nurse or a healthcare worker asking you who your contacts were. So you have to remember the individuals that you were in contact with. And what we're doing is comparing this to word of mouth contact tracing, which is just you calling your friends or your coworkers saying, hey, I got tested positive for contact tracing. The reason why word of mouth of contact tracing is also important is not everyone has a privilege to have manual contact tracing or automated contact tracing working. For example, think of undocumented immigrants who are worried of surveillance um, or individuals who do not speak a certain language such as English um, that 
the, uh, the manual contact tracers and the automated contact trace tracing functions under. And so we're just looking at uh, the effectiveness of just communicating with your community. And what our results, uh, our initial results show is that when comparing automated contact tracing to word of mouth contact tracing, um, obviously automated contact tracing, if you have 100% of the population being traced, is extremely effective. However, word of mouth contact tracing can also do an effective job if 100% of the population is complying with the efforts. And then what really matters is how many people you end up contacting um, about, about the fact that you tested positive. So uh, individuals are contacting 85, sorry, 25 um, of their friends and coworkers um, in the simulation. And you can see that that makes a big difference. However, it's unclear if everyone can spread the, the message to so many people. And so it's going to be, again, as Seth said, a collective effort. How do we work as a community together? So these are two projects that are being explored within the modeling team. However, I'd like to emphasize that this group is extremely large, looking at multiple different problems. Uh, one of my favorite pro uh, projects is the interview project, where uh, students and the, uh, the project leaders um, are calling the community members um, and asking them questions about how they're dealing with these issues. And with that information, what, uh, what, the, what the students are able to do is relay this information to community leaders such as North Fair Eric's Community Council, El Concilio, and um, youth centers. And this is extremely important because then we unravel problems about how uh, students are unable to access internet in some of, some of their homes to do their Zoom calls. And then we start thinking about how do we address these issues? So these are just some of the projects that are being worked on and I'm going to leave it at that um, and bring it back to you, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much for your presentation, John Su. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm also interested to think about the sort of longevity of your research. Like, what happens when you create this modeling group? What are what are sort of the next? What are the next steps? Or you know, with this kind of initiative and structure, it'll be interesting to hear how that works and how you collaborated with um, ETH. Um, so now we're gonna we're gonna turn to our breakout rooms. And um, I think now, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, Jansu, but could we say that each table is creating their own modeling group? I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> we're asking you uh, to share your yeah. COVID experience. Is that true? Yeah, okay. Um, we're asking each of you, there'll be a set of questions and there'll be a note taker at each table. Um, which uh, we, we just want to hear about what your experiences were during co or are during COVID. What are those issues that are most relevant to you? Um, what would you what what would you tackle? What would be your your kind of point issue? Um, and we'll do this for 15 minutes. And um, we encourage you to just share with there'll be like as I said, there'll be a note taker at each at each group and just kind of enjoy. Enjoy yourself. Have a good time, and we'll we'll all rejoin in fifteen minutes for our Q and A. Thank you. So for this next part, I just um, I thought we could just do a little bit of a, a Q and A, both um, with questions we may have for Seth and Jansu, but also we can take some questions from the audience as well. If you just click on the Q and A button you can enter um questions or responses or you know you know let us know you know if if there's something interesting in particular you you had findings at your table please do share but um maybe i'll go back to some of those initial questions that that sprung to mind from your presentations um i think yeah, so set one of my questions was um, how, like, what does it take to, 
to have the government take on take on an app, a tracing app. I imagine it, it has to do with uh, the, the combination of stakeholders that you worked with. Um, like what part of government? We did have, you know, a question from the audience about the U.S. How public health, how public health works in the U.S. with county and state, and how it's regulated by federal guidelines. So, is it similar in Switzerland? So it's kind of a two two tiered question. All right. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Yeah, I saw that in the Q and A. I just figured that I can't answer. Actually, mm -hmm. I can only leave another question. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um, the question about um, the states and the counties, if I understand it right, is that it depends a bit. And some aspects are managed by states, which are our cantons, and some aspects are managed nationally. Mm -hmm. So, however, during COVID, uh, <laughs> sorry, during COVID, it was um, a bit more top down. So, because they were actually saying it's a special situation. And then the cantons, which are your states, they had less um, less to say, or let's say it was decided for them top down to speed up the process to just actually, mm. the second part is like, they had to actually make a change in the law. So they had to change the law that this app is actually the official Swiss app. So so they went to this legislation process to, um, to just get the, how you say, legal base to run this app as the official app and the other thing which was also a problem is like app stores let's say google play or this apple store they don't actually allow this um apps to just enter the store it has to really be endorsed by the government so mm. they don't want any app to come up and then just start tracking mm. and so it was really important that actually the government himself they had contact with the app stores and stuff like that so okay. there's a there's a lot of change necessary and it's a lot of um mm -hmm. it's easier if it's managed top down if it has to happen fast because our cantons they're just like otherwise it takes a while to de decide. Yeah, and that's quite, um, it, it strikes me how different um, that is just thinking about how the US has approached COVID um, very much locally by county and state as opposed to to federal. So yeah, did it, the, the, the folks who developed that app, were they, did they come in as a, like a startup? How, how was, how did that app kind of move forward? What did they have to succeed as a as a group? Yeah, it was like that. There was this one, there's this one guy, and he his name is Matthias Velik, and he, he is a founder of a company called Ubic. Mm -hmm. And Ubic it's um is a company that does apps. For example, it does um a weather app, which is a national app, like Swiss weather app, and he also worked with other partners together to do the SBB app and the SBB is our uh, public transportation system uh, yeah. like the SBB and so they did also like apps in a scale which were already a national wide thing like this is the company and the company has like a really cool office in central Zurich but we all got shut in the way during the shutdown everyone was in the home office so our hackathon happened nine or ten days after the shutdown so people were at home Mm -hmm. And these people did apps and they were kind of bored, I guess. Mm -hmm. So they decided to join Code versus COVID because they are developers. They do apps that scale and they are bored and they want to get out. So this is how they started. And they picked up on a recent um, discussion about how this data that is, um, that how the data should be stored. Should it be centralized or should it be decentralized? Because this was a big issue. And this conversation was going on in Germany, for example, and in France, where they had a solution, but not, not everyone liked that solution. So he took that concept and ideas and from there started to use his resources that he had to join a conversation that was ongoing to then just like do the hack and use Bluetooth for proximity measuring and kicked this idea away. He didn't win code versus COVID, but they took it on. And what was really important about this is it was a 
it was a huge research team of like the brightest people. And uh, there's a really, really cool video, which was just published two days ago, where one of those scientists explains the whole process in more detail, how it went and how was important what was important to get this app running. So I will definitely share the link with you. It's a 45 minute keynote of a guy deeply involved in developing it and what it took also from a personal side as what kind of um, attitude you had to have to actually get this done. And this is a, a great learning he's, uh, he will share in this keynote. So definitely a, a good um, insight to yeah. follow up actually. Yeah, share it with me, please. Or yeah, that that. I can send it out to the participants. Yeah. Um, just one more, one little follow up question to that. So did did they did they meet people at the hackathon and kind of bring in people that they just met there? Because it sounds like they were already pretty organized and and you know quite talented. But did they add on additional talents that they met at the hackathon? That was yeah. They, actually, this hackathon. Um, they were like this company themselves. So I think um, they onboarded two other people they met at the hackathon. And um, one person they onboarded for the, like one person they onboarded, they, she or he, I'm not sure, she was a psychologist. So she had that, um, that other perspective, which like, I mean, kind of, how does a person feel using this app kind of input, which was important because, it's a bit about psychological security. You have to, you have to feel safe with this app. You cannot like use this app and think like it's it's, it's going to get me busted somehow. They know where I am, like all that stuff. You have to approach it from a human perspective. And they were developers, so it was a it was a nice fit. So I think, but what the core strength was was that um, developers usually. Um, they have, um, there, there is a clear way of how to proceed in a project. So for them, it's like, it was a bit clear how to approach this also from their professional perspective. And I think the biggest gain was to like, all the mentors that we have, all these people that had um, insights to epidemiology or health, they could always con contact those people. So it was a huge network, but they had their core competencies, they onboarded some other perspectives and then they use the network. So this is how they okay. moved on. And Jansu, you your group also had had a pre-existing network stakeholders um, that you had that I understand that you had worked with over the years. Did you have to bring in new stakeholders for for the for the COVID project? Or did you already have these pre-existing relationships? Is is kind of one of my questions. Um, and because thinking about how you went to, you know, making the most relevant research or thinking that could be applicable and move forward. Yeah, uh, and that um, that's exactly right. So one of one of the strengths that we had um, in the upper hand is, is that we already had pre-existing stakeholders, and we had a community that we needed to respond to. Um, these are these are the individuals that need needed our help and so that's why that's why we did what we did um, we heard them and heard their needs and their requests we did develop um, new stakeholders uh, throughout uh, throughout this project and new relationships um, one of them is uh, reg lab at stanford university and they are um, a group of Lawyers, um, uh, GSB uh, faculty members, um, a large, larger network of expertise uh, to collaborate with. Um, we got involved with working with Google Brain um, and other universities uh, to help with this effort and to help our uh, existing stakeholders. One of the new stakeholders uh, was the public health. Uh, 
in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. Um, and we were specifically, I saw that there was a question working specifically with the contact tracing team and the epidemiologist, actually some of our students um, ended up joining their efforts and their team to help them directly. So they got hired by them. And that was really exciting to see how there was this beautiful spillover from academia into um, policy making uh, solutions and also teaming up with corporations and other research research organizations to tackle these problems. Yeah. Well, you have to have all those different unique skills, positions, you know, different types of organizations to, to be able to pull something like this off. I mean, which also makes me think of, you know, the challenges of collaborating on something and moving something forward um, because each, each collaborator or stakeholder has their own, you know, uh, needs. They all need something out of it. Right. Um, yeah. Do you, I, this question is kind of to you both. I'm curious if you think we talked a little bit, in our pre-discussion about, you know, that both of your initiatives were really early, you know, early responses to to COVID and, you know, kind of got right in there and and um, started thinking about it. I'm curious if you think um, what it would be, like if you were to do that now, knowing what we know a few months later, which I don't know, frankly, I think isn't a whole lot, right? But there are some one of the things we do know is that we're not opening up quickly. The new nor, you know, there isn't, or I, I have a personal sense that there isn't a some kind of normal where we're returning to quickly. Would you, I mean, how would your approach change? Would your set of questions be different now? Or is, is there anything, do you have any reflection on what that might be now? Would it be different? Either one of you. I guess I can go since my mic is already off. <laughs> um, well, I think there are, there are two responses to that. Me personally, I think I was uh, quite stressed and the way that I cope with stress is through research. So mm -hmm. I just throw myself into the deep end and try to um, learn as much as I can. And I realized that some of the uh, attenders also did the same thing. So that's kind of mm -hmm. cool. Um, but I think what I would have done even more is um, I mentioned our our stakeholders and thinking about those who were falling between the cracks. And that was originally what my um, my goal was to help them. But I think I would since I now know that it takes it's going to you know, we're going to be in this for a really long time. I think I would have given myself even more time to come up with projects that were really geared towards understanding the struggles that they were going through. Um, and I think we did the best that we can. Um, and I'm, I'm incredibly proud of uh, what we've done. And I think I would just, uh, right now, what I'm trying to do is think even more critically about how to help those individuals uh, who are falling through those cracks and what our results could mean for, for them. Is there anything um, set? Do you have anything? You don't have to answer that if you, <laughs> it's up to you. Yes, at this moment in March 27, uh, I don't know if I would have do this differently, but our biggest challenge was to get like reliable data because it was not quite there. It was not measured yet. And all this kind of other data you had was a bit tricky. So I don't really know in which sense, but it was not, it was not so much. It was not reliable and the people had a hard time using this uh, data. So this is something that if we would start this now, this was, th this would be different. Like we would have another data set, like mm -hmm. to actually start working. And then the other thing, which is more like a personal thing is like, once I, once I, we had this organization, but we said we do this nonprofit hackathon. So I decided to, of course, work voluntarily to this project. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to volunteer 72 hours. And then actually doing that 72 hours is like nearly, it's like two weeks. It's like it's a mm -hmm. lot of time. Like if you just say it's 72 hours, you're going to work on that. And the hackathon is more like a sprint. This is like 72 hours. You just do like three days of 16 hours or four days. Okay. 
but it was so exhausting and it was mm -hmm. so much time like if you put whatever you do in a hackathon to a normal schedule of a working days i mean speaking for europe it's a lot of work and it's, it's it's impressive to see what you can achieve during a weekend and i would still do it but um now i would just like approach it a bit different more like a math marathon than than a sprint like as mm -hmm. john so said it's like in that thing in that situation we're looking for a quick response and it was really tiring so what is really important is now to keep up that mentality to keep further inventing and to keep pushing because before you get used to it and forget what is actually happening out there you just stay home i mean mm. you have to be alert somehow it's hard to stay remember that this still it's a crisis like sometimes i keep forgetting forgetting that <laughs> unfortunately yeah yeah um we have a question from steve in our q a he says i'm a teacher can this app be used in a small population such as a public school or a class of students? And then how long does it take for data to be made available once the app becomes usable and participants are using the app? So maybe we'll start with the first one. Um, as a teacher, could, could this app be used with a small population? Um. Oh. Should I answer or is that, do you want to answer? Uh, you want me to answer? Um, okay, so this is uh, something that we've been looking into. Um, there are organizations um, out there who are geared towards getting contact tracing, Bluetooth-based contact tracing apps um, and devices to schools, to workforces. Um, yeah, and so it's a, it's a matter of uh, reaching out to the right organizations. And it, I think there are so many different schools responding to this in a different way. Um, our, my school at Stanford, what we've uh, decided to do is get students tested every week. So students are getting tested every week. Okay. He also asks, or, or Seth, do you have a response? You wanted to say any, something? Um, sorry. Not necessarily now, maybe later. Okay. Um, he also asked, how long does it take for data to be made available once the app becomes usable and participants are using the app? What kind of data? How long does it take for the data to be available? I'm not sure. If you like, I can quickly explain how this app works. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure because the app usually works like that. You have that app running on your phone, then experience like symptoms, you go to the doctor. When you go to the doctor and you're tested, you will, if you're positive, you will receive a code and that code is valid for 24 hours. And within that 24 hours, you will enter this code into your app and then it will retrace who you have met for longer than 15 minutes in the past 10 days or like it will go backwards. So data is not made available in that sense. Actually, there is nothing much available than some epidemic. There are some stats or like uh, the number of infections. That kind of data is made available by the app. But how it works is actually it's totally anonymized and um, you just receive this code, you enter it. And if you do that, then you, the people who were meeting you get in information. And this, until you get this code, usually takes like, depending on the doctor, how busy testing facilities are and stuff like that. So I would say you test, you get your results within 24 hours, you enter the code and then it starts pushing. Never pushed for me though, so far. Thank I would like to just respond as a researcher. Um, so the contact tracing, from applications, uh, researchers do not have any access to that information. Um, for manual contact tracing, uh, we are given a little bit more leverage of, of the data um, that's provided, but if it's app-based contact tracing, we get uh, none of that information. Okay, thank you. We also have a question from um, Tamara or Tamara. Um, she asks, I think this is for you, Jansu, um, 
SMC Health has a lot of different functions. Can you say which divisions you worked with? So my team did not work that closely with the public health uh, team. Um, I go into all of their calls and listen in on their requests, but because I'm a modeler, I am a lot more focused on um, taking some of the data and then looking at how that's going to impact um, uh, San Francisco County. Um, but so we work really closely with the contact tracing team um, within the health organization. So the manual contact tracing uh, group within the public health sectors of the counties. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, everyone, to um, the audience and to our speakers. I think we'll wrap up now, unless there's a burning, anything burning from you, Jean C. Orsett? Yeah, just I just shared that link now. You should definitely like oh. go rewatch that. I shared it in a chat for everyone. So it's okay. really interesting. It's a, it's it's a lot of insights there. Like. It's good to watch. Um, and I would also uh, add that, you know, each of us here have had our own experience with COVID-19. Um, and there are different people out there who've had different experiences. And so it's so important for us to communicate and talk to one another through this difficult time and also to vote. And that's yeah. well said. Very important point. Thank you. Yes, everybody vote. Um, so thank you so much to our audience and to our speakers. Um, I believe that the talk will be available um, on our website afterwards if you would like to share it with anyone. Um, and please, you know, come back to Swiss Next San Francisco to our website, um, SwissNextSF.org. We have a lot of events coming up. The Bay Area Science Festival still has another day or two. So check out more things with them. And I believe Hack Zurich, you guys have a, a climathon. Is that the right pronunciation? A climate? Is that right? It's uh, not all. It's on, yeah. But okay. Yeah, you should participate. Yeah. Climaton. It's yeah. important. To think about or work on climate change. So thank you, everyone. Stay active and, and um, let's make this world a better place. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.